This is a talk I gave at Avatars about a, a couple of years ago. And in this, we're bringing together the words and also the, the, the chart images that Barbara had said about the outer space and putting that in the context of what we now know about uh, uh, the universe from modern um, astronomy. For me, this journey began uh, when I, I saw Francis Brabazon uh, give a, an enormous teddy bear to a, a child, and I asked him, what's he doing? And he said, well, he wanted the child to understand just how big Barber is. Barber said a lot about the bigness of the universe, and uh, as early as 1921, he was talking about nebula, which was the early term for uh, galaxies, and he, and, he, and he said that the number of worlds that, that exist are too great, uh, that they're beyond human imagination. Now, why that is interesting, we'll see. When Barber talked about the great number of worlds, that wasn't actually the uh, common view at the time. The, the picture you see on the right is actually from 1910, so about the time when Barber was a teenager, and you can see there, it was understood there were worlds, but then the stars were just seen as kind of like little dots. And uh, the, there's a model there I've given there, which is of the, at the time, 1922, the, the main model that was used of the universe, and it was just seen as being one, uh, what we'd now call a galaxy. It was just seen as one body. In 1924, which is like, three years after Barbara was talking about the innumerable worlds, Edwin Hubble, Hubble who's the, the great big uh, telescope that's out in space at the moment, is named after, he actually was looking at, at the, the known um, uh, you know, schemes for where, what, it, what was and wasn't in, in our known universe, and he saw this blob, which you can see pictured there in the, in the upper left-hand corner, and he worked out from calculating the distance that it would actually be an entire other galaxy, which at the time they called nebulae. So until that point, it wasn't even established that there were other galaxies in the universe. And even his views weren't really accepted till after 1929. So you can see how Barbo has actually uh, preceded a lot of this, and uh, as we'll see further. Many of the things that Barbo said only are starting to make sense to us now. For example, one, one quote from him I've got here, it is not possible to see all the universes, notice the term universes and the worlds, they are not visible even with modern means, yet the scientists will come to know about them. Now that's, he's saying this in 1962. It was only in 2002 that the Hubble Space Telescope pointed to the darkest place in the sky, you can see the image there on the top uh, uh, left hand corner, and it's a tiny, tiny little spot. So they were looking at the furthest they could see into the universe. And what they found was even in that little space, there were tens of thousands of galaxies, which are, that's the actual photo there that was taken. Uh, so now we do know that, yes, we can't see the end of the, the universe. And this diagram on the lower right shows just how small the area is. Similarly, in 1963, Barber talked about expanding, contracting, and evolving and dissolving universes. That has only been sort of realised uh, more recently. It, it was theorised that there were black holes as early as 1958, but we didn't actually have evidence of them until uh, 1977, so 1967, which is, which is a good uh, few years after Barber uh, made that comment. But apart from that, they weren't photographed until more recently, and until in fact just a couple of years ago, as, as this shows. There's similar parallels in regards to what Barber said about uh, nothingness, that, that, there is, that all gas is, is nothing, and yet the nothing is. We now talk about dark matter, uh, and, and uh, you know, we've even construed that it might be like 90% of the universe is, is composed of this sort of nothingness. On the other end of the spectrum, Barber also predicted a lot about our smallness. Now, what I mean by that, uh, this, is a, this is a quote from him in 1962. He said, the world of ours is nothing but the most finite speck in the speck. It is nothing, not even a tiny speck. Uh, if you look out on a, on a clear night and, and can actually see the Milky Way, you'll see it as a sort of stripe in the, uh, in the sky, as, as, the, as the photo is here. What you're actually looking at is just an arm of the Milky Way galaxy. So it's just even a, a 
portion of the Milky Way. Uh, you can see in this diagram there that there's the arm of the um, of the galaxy, and, and our sun is in that arm. You can see this smallness in this diagram, which shows where the sun sits in our Milky Way galaxy. And you've got to remember here that there's something like 250 billion stars. So each star is a sun with a, probably a solar system like ours. This got me looking at some of, other, uh, some of the other terms that Barbie uses when he's talking about outer space. He often talks about the bubbles and the drops. And if you look at the diagram in the, in the uh, left-hand corner from Barbie, you'll actually see uh, the D is where creation is supposed to have started. Then um, B is the is the drop forms surrounded by another drops, and then they and then they end up in C, which is extraordinarily similar to how the Big Bang is now envisaged as as this sort of single starting point, and and the sort of endless diffusion of 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 forms. Even more uncanny. The fact that Barbie uses bubbles as, as as the main metaphor for the universe fits in very well with with how the universe now is seen as sort of a cosmic foam or a frothy network. That that was an idea that was first put forward by John Wheeler in 1955, but now it, it's the done thing. And you can see in these images, the uh, they're actually showing how the the galaxies would fit together if you could if you could sort of stand at some point away from the universe you'd be seeing it as this sort of network of 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 basically bubbles with with the galaxies being on the outside of the bubbles similarly we find a lot of talk from barbara about waves and tides uh, this is this is a good example here a drop gets formed innumerable such drops converge to form waves and several waves combine to create Bauti or tides. That's from Tiffin talks. Now, note again that the year that's 1926, and that's a, there's a diagram that Barber did about that. Now, if you compare that chart to this, which is the uh, current view of the of the universe or part thereof, and that that actually shows the wave structure. It's, it's a common thing with uh, astronomers to talk about the the colliding galaxies and how they form these 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 uh, endless waves, and you can see our Milky Way in regard to that wave formation. Similarly, we find that Barber talks about fields, strands and ranges when, he, when he's discussing uh, space. He talks about innumerable universes that are interlaced with each other and chains and, or ranges of Earths or, or gross worlds. And sometimes he's used the image of a, of a head of hair with the universes expanding out of that. And you can also see it in this little diagram on the lower right where he's got these strings basically of different uh, worlds coming out from the creation point. You can see how similar that is to the head and hair image. And we do have uh, strands of galaxies. But what's more amazing is, is how Barber's diagram actually looks similar to what we now know about where clusters of galaxies and how they're shaped. This is a, this is a quote from him from 1927. He's saying, out of it, the hair, comes everything. And then he drew a picture of a man's head and hair. The universes pour out of the Godhead. They are like God's hair. Your head must symbolize, must, uh, symbolize God and your, and your hair, the universes. Now, have a look at this other picture below. This is the current big picture of how our universe, our galaxies are, are molded around the bubble, if you like, of emptiness. Um, and, and this big cluster is called um, Lanakia. And you can see our, our Milky Way is on one side of it, but you can see it's very similar to a head of hair. It's this form of, of clusters of galaxies around that, that's expanding outward. I want to look next at what Barber said about planets. Now, we tend to forget that in the Middle Ages and even fairly recently, we didn't really have a clear idea about what the stars were. You can see even in the 1600s, and this is Herschel's map, which is one of the first they were just little lights. We didn't really know a lot beyond that. This is why it's so amazing that in 1927, Maya Baba says that every star is a mighty sun with a solar system of evolving planets like our own. That wasn't the, it was, it was theorised, but there was no proof of it. He even talked about innumerable suns. Now, just a year ago, we had our very first photo of another solar system. You can see the, the photo on the right. There's a sun and two planets. That's only a very young system. It's only 17 million years old. But we now have images of other solar systems. We have quite a number of statements from Barbara about uh, 
thousands and thousands of other planets from 1921 and systems with planets we now know that the that there are countless systems we've we've at least found 40,000 other other systems with with uh, planets but the thing to remember about this is that it was really only theorized in 1989 and we didn't start discovering them until 1995 so this all happened a fair bit after Barber. Barber also said that there were worlds tiny and huge ones. Again, this wasn't uh, known at, at the time. Now we know that there are very large worlds, like this graph here shows, and, and also ones closer to our side, uh, size. But at the time, that we had no idea about the variety of sizes of other planets. I want to turn now to what Barber explained about the different types of world. It's important to note that he emphasised that the planets are in different phases, they're different evolving stages. So we know that that happened on our own world, and but he's also saying that that, that happens on other worlds. In Everything and the Nothing, Barbara actually explains, he gives a bit of a rundown, which I've summarised here, about World 1 being stones through to World 7 having a whole range of, uh, of life forms. I've tried to work out how what Barber said in the Everything and the Nothing can be translated into how many types, how many numbers of worlds we have of each sort. And this is what I came up with, a sort of upside down pyramid with the, the most common being gaseous down to the least common being uh, the ones that got humans in. And now I'll explain how I got to that. Firstly, Barber himself says that this process takes ages and ages and cycles after cycles with various species, that's in God Speaks. And we can see that in our own planet, which is the only one we have to go on. This pie chart actually shows where where life began in terms of time. And you can see there's a, there's a bluish sort of uh, quadrant, which is no life. And then the bulk of time has been just with uh, single cell animals like bacteria and so on. Whereas mammals are just squeezed into the into the final section. So if this is how our planet evolved, then it, it could well be that there's there's a similar sort of breakdown in the number of planets that are without life and with simple life and, and complex life all over the universe. The other reason I'm thinking that this upside down pyramid might be uh, an authentic sort of representation of how the universe is, is because Barbara himself talks about there being countless embodied beings and that, that other planets beside Earth are living beings. He talks about thousands and thousands of other planets with different evolving stages. So we have it from him that there's more than just one world that's like this. Uh, when we look again, this is, a, this is a further example, even if we just take the life forms that we know on Earth, most of them are actually bacteria, and you'll see there's a small slice that I've ringed in yellow that's animals. And even out of those animals, most of them are insects, and then the tiniest portion is mammals. So if that's how it is in the whole universe, then there's probably uh, only a tiny minority of, of planets that, that have advanced life forms. If we start with the types of worlds, then we start with gaseous uh, forms. Now, Barber talks about that everything starts with these gaseous forms, uh, semi-gaseous and semi-material. Now, when this was put down in God Speaks, we didn't have these magnificent photos that we have now. This one's from 1992, which shows what are called as the pillars of creation. They're, they're actually enormous gaseous clouds that where the stars are formed. So these are, these are huge th structures that we now know exist. Barber says that the basis of creation is nothing but gas and that everything came out of that, out of that gas. And, and there are a number of charts that he's uh, done or commissioned that show that, the runner's chart. And I've got the other one down in the corner here where you can see the nebula, which, as I said, is the old term for um, uh, gas clouds come uh, uh, galaxies. Here's some more images of the star-creating areas of the universe. The, the image on the left is the head of the, the horsehead nebulae. And a nebula, in this case, is, is how we use the term now, which is as a, as a gigantic gas cloud. So this is where stars are forming uh, right now. We know from Barber that the first type of worlds are what he calls gaseous states. And uh, he also talks about it as being wind planets. Now, that's very interesting because the ones that we have, the gas giants that we have, have, have incredibly fast winds, far, far quicker than a, than a hurricane. 
The second type are stone worlds, and we have quite a lot of examples of that in our own solar system. We've got Mercury, the Moon, a number of asteroids, and it's interesting that Barber talks about habitable and non-habitable worlds. So he, quite as early as 1962, he acknowledged that there's worlds that are completely vacant. Then he talks about worlds that have stones and wind, and we know that it's extremely windy on Venus, although extremely hot, and we know that there's clouds and so on on, on Mars and several other planets. When we talk about worlds that have life, Bubba talks about them taking cycles and cycles to develop to cool down, and that's exactly how we know uh, the, today. We that's how we believe the, the worlds have, have evolved. But one of the interesting things he says is that evolution of forms begins with the oceans. We we now know that that's a lot of worlds have have water. We didn't know this before, and the current theory is that that's where life began in the oceans. Bubba talks about how life began when uh, the water became rusty. Now we know that uh, uh, we have actually fossil uh, remains from, from bacteria that, that have actually created sort of what, like a rust-like or even banded iron in places around, around the world two billion years ago and earlier. I struck a problem though when I looked at, at Barber's talk about uh, worlds that had minerals and vegetation only because we know that land plants only appeared about 470 million years ago. However, when I looked at this more closely, Barber talks about a, a sequence going from stone, metal, to little to seaweed, to mushroom, and then, and then the higher plant forms. Now, when you look at it this way, it actually makes a lot of sense because we know that blue-green algae was present on Earth 3.5 million billion years ago, so right in the beginning. Uh, we also have this statement from, from Barber about how the, the rustiness turned into algae, and that's exactly the, the steps of life that, that have been found on Earth. You'll notice that the next life form Barber has on his sequence is mushroom coming straight after seaweed. Well, if you look at this picture on the on the top right hand corner, that's a man with a fossil of a mushroom. There were once gigantic mushrooms all over the landscape in, uh, in the world and also less uh, visible ones, but they were the, one of the earliest forms of vegetation, if you want to call it vegetation, uh, on the earth. The sixth type of world that Barber discusses has got all these previous ingredients of stone, wind, metal and so on, and then animals and we definitely have lots of examples of that in our own world uh, from the fossil record. If you're familiar with Rainer Gailey's chart of evolution that, that Barber oversaw, you'd notice that there's a whole section there on birds and I often used to wonder about that, uh, how can there be sort of bird planets, but we know from our own prehistory that the dinosaurs actually were more related to birds than they are to reptiles and that now we've found that a lot of them were feathered. So there probably are or were bird worlds of some sort. There is a passage where Barber was talking about uh, previous life forms and he, he talks about something that he said was, was so peculiar, it was like half bat, and very large, uh, 15 feet high, legs like an ostrich um, and a small head. We now have a lot of fossils of, of flying reptiles that certainly could well have been one of the species that Barber talked about. As a bit of an aside, I, I find it somewhat comforting to think that there could be other planets that have the equivalent of dinosaurs and so on, particularly when we have this statement from Barber, which is in Beams, that even if a species of plant or animal becomes extinct, it, it doesn't uh, arrest the advancing life stream, because the soul can always form a new species or even use an existing species. And we, we've got examples of that in evolution on Earth. Uh, the one I often give is, is the fact that you've got the thylacine or the Tasmanian wolf, uh, as you see in the, in the far left, which was actually in, in, in manner and, and, and form very similar to the dingo, which replaced it. In South America, you had a saber-toothed marsupial, that was very like the saber-toothed tiger that replaced it. And if you go to Mauritius, there used to be the dodo, and now you've got things like turkeys and, and chickens basically taking the same role and having similar form. So perhaps this is also all over the universe. This means that somewhere in the universe there should be planets that are dominated by something that's equivalent to what we'd call a mammal, and also that there'd be planets that are dominated by something that's equivalent to what we'd call apes. 
in, in our own past on the Earth, it's now found that there were actually quite advanced ape species, not only just in Africa, but they, they've found the skeletons in, uh, in Europe and parts of Asia. So we know that there was a time when, there, when that even Earth had a lot of ape species, which isn't the case now. The highest world form that Barber talks about are human planets. And it's, it's sometimes become a bit of a, a controversy in the Barber scene how many there, there are, because in some places Barber talks about just three or four. He talks about four of the worlds that are inhabited or the ABC worlds. In other, other cases, he's talking about many. Uh, the, the term he uses most often, though, I found is 18,000. And you'll see here that I've got a whole list of the times he's used 18,000 worlds with human life. I don't think we can be very sure about what Baba means by 18,000. I don't think it's necessarily a precise number because uh, that's a, a common Hindu term for what they call Jaya Lux, which means sort of a, almost like infinite, infinite thousands. And you see 18,000 and series of eights being used in a lot of the sacred uh, literature of India, uh, 18,000 year spans and, and the uh, units within, within some of the epics, the, the Puranas, for example. Let's suppose, though, that Barber's 18,000 is the precise number of human worlds. Well, uh, if we divide them into the sea worlds, which is 100% mind that he talks about, then this is roughly what 10,000 worlds would look like, these little dots here. Similarly, the B worlds that Barber said are 75% mind and 25% heart, if we assume that they're slightly less than the, the sea worlds, then that's roughly 8,000, and this is what 8,000 worlds would look like. Do we have any other uh, idea about what these humans are like from what Barber had said? Well, in one piece he mentions that, that in some places they can survive for hundreds of years. He also talks them about them being much more intelligent than, than humans on Earth, uh, very much scientific. There, there's a a piece where to Sheila, he, he's, he's supposed to have said that they're creating things all the time and that they don't sleep much. But the, one of the biggest things he mentions in a number of uh, books is, is the fact that they don't necessarily use language, that instead they're capable of, of reading people's minds and transmitting their thoughts by expressions and, and uh, telepathy. We could draw some comfort from the fact that Baba says that those planets are like the Earth in many respects and that he also said that they resemble us in, in culture and science and in all material matters, so presumably they wouldn't be too unrecognisable. On the other hand, he does talk about some odd things, like uh, worlds that where all the forms, including the human forms, are very small. He talks about uh, places that, where people have sort of no skin but membranes. A lot of this discussion about the, the, these people are sort of uh, don't have a, the same emotional development, uh, dry without love, and one of the things I found most shocking is the whole idea that, that uh, no, none of these humans can experience the subtle world. Uh, there's no lovers of God in these other worlds. One thing we do know from Barbara is that there's supposedly a, a progression from sort of higher ape forms then to the C worlds, then to the B worlds, then to the A worlds. And one interesting quote I found here is, is, is that uh, after giving up the highest animal form, it, that's the soul, will incarnate in the human form with extraordinary intellect. So in an interesting way, our intellect actually d diminishes going from the C worlds to the B worlds to the A worlds, but although we have higher uh, heart qualities. This also brings up the fact that Earth wasn't always Earth. That uh, Baba says that, that there's a planet just behind us, uh, behind it spiritually. But the interesting th thing is the way he puts this. He says when the world nearest, when that the current Earth world near nearest the on point cools down, which means spiritually dies, then the world behind it uh, takes its place. So that could mean that we're actually on the precipice of, of being no longer the Earth. I'll get into that. But also that perhaps Earth was somewhere else, particularly because Barber says that at the beginning of this cycle, people were 14 feet tall and could live up to 300 years. We haven't found any fossils like that yet. And he also says that millions of years ago, the, the world was quite different. On this point, in 1933 in Kashmir, Barber said that the avatar 
comes down innumerable times, but he said only in the last cycle, 530, sorry, 5,329 times, and, and then there'll be one more time, and once more in 450 years, and then the end will be the 5,330th time. Now, if that's correct, I, I did some maths on this, then let's say a maximum cycle of uh, avataric cycle of 1,400, then you're that means that the avataric cycle began about seven and a half million years ago, and if we take it to the least, then it's about two and a half million years ago. But in either case, at least from the fossil record as we have it at the moment, there were only uh, uh, apes and um, later ape men. Uh, there weren't people on Earth, so uh, that makes you wonder where Earth was. At any rate, where we are, which is the A world, according to Maya Barbara's is where things are 50% mind and 50% heart and where you have had all the recent uh, avataric advents, the, the masters, the spiritual pantheon uh, and all sort of spiritual progress. There's a couple of beautiful quotes that I like uh, that Barbara gave on this. One is that it says, they must come to this earth spec for the sake of the heart. And this has sort of been in, el elaborated a bit in, in um, uh, what am I doing here, where, where, it's, where the, this is a taking Barbara's uh, words and adding a bit. They're saying, so after innumerable lifetimes, the people from these other planets must incarnate to learn the biggest lesson of all, love. And then she breaks it down into love for family, country and so on, and eventually love for God. According to Barber, uh, the average person goes through 8,400,000 human lives. So doing a bit of maths again, uh, if you divided that between... 18,000 worlds, the C world, the B world, and the A. I worked that out that, uh, let's say that would be about 400 odd uh, incarnations per world, and that would mean that uh, at the very least we'd probably spent maybe 30,000 years inca incarnating on Earth. But it, the beauty about that is the fact that a lot of our lives are behind us. Just simply by being born on Earth, we're actually in front. And so that when we're looking into the stars, we're perhaps looking back into our our own incarnations of previous previous times. I want to say something here about Earth being special. Astronomically, we know that Earth isn't special. It's just a tiny little uh, planet on a, next to a, next to a very average star in a very average galaxy. And Barbara himself acknowledges this uh, in, in terms of placing Earth as, as the center of the universe. And this is the quote from 1962 that uh, that it that in infin infinity there cannot be a center, or there cannot be a point that's a center, yet on the chart that we have made, the Earth is the center of, of infinite space. And why? It's because humans have to come here. And I, I do notice when you look at the chart that Barbara uh, authorized, you can see that the universe is spread out and just dots all over the place. And it's, it's more the fact that the importance of Earth, it's not exactly where it is. I've heard the same argument about the fact that Barbara tends to seem to uh, prefer the, the, the Middle East and India and, and saying that, that that's the hub of spirituality. But actually, it does make sense, his, his talk about that being uh, the central point. Uh, th this is a map I've done of the, of the whole world. And where we know that Jesus, Muhammad, Abraham, uh, Buddha, Rama, and so on, lived is all basically in that circle, the, uh, and which matches what Baba talks about, the egg-shaped uh, a circle that's 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 the closest point to the on point, but you can also see how central it is to the rest of the world, and, and that's exactly how religions have moved out from that core point. Is there any evidence, though, from science that Earth is special? Well, surprisingly, there is. This chart on the on the right hand side shows the, some of the the current understanding of where exoplanets are in relation to their suns. And our sun is marked Sol in, in the red circle. And you can see that our system is rather different from the rest. It's actually got the smaller planets and they're further out. Uh, we found that a lot of the, the planetary systems are actually quite violent. They have, they have solar flares. They have quite crazy, unstable planets. So it is po quite likely that we are on a special planet. Barbara says there's life all over the universe. Where is it? Well, we haven't really looked very far. This shows our Milky Way, and the tiny little inner circle is where our sun is, and the 90% of all the 
planets we've so far spotted are just in that tiny little white circle and even a black circle there of, of where some of the other exoplanets have been found, that's still only 1% of the Milky Way, so we've hardly looked. Within our Milky Way, we know there's a band of, uh, that's called the habitable zone, where our Earth is. You can see it's sort of right in the middle of that donut. And there are some estimates that there's about 50 to 250 billion solar systems just in our galaxy and out of them they've done some statistical calculations of the likelihood of Earth-like worlds and so on and there's some scientists that even calculate that from that there's possibility of something like 33 worlds that might have something like people and civilizations but that's just done on stats. There's plenty of room out there. This is the Cigar Galaxy and it's got 20 billion solar systems. This is the Grand Spiral, it has 250 billion solar systems. Now think of that, planets and suns. Whirlpool with 100 billion solar systems. Sombrero with another 100 billion solar systems. There's also countless galaxies at the edge of where we can see. This is one really far out one, which itself has got 8 billion solar systems. And some of these are much larger than our Milky Way. This is IC 1011 and you can see it's much much bigger than Milky Way of perhaps a hundred trillion solar systems. In this vastness where are we? Barbara has given us a, a couple of charts it's not clear whether they're actual uh, you know uh, maps but um, one he does show is, is strings of world that are stone, metal, vegetable, human and so on and you can see the bunch that are interconnected and he's also got the same sort of thing coming from going from and to God. The interesting thing from this chart, which was done in, uh, before 1933, is this quote. Of these numerous gross worlds, seven, each of which we have distinguished with a number, are nearer to the creator point. And he says, the three worlds A, B and C in the central range are to be regarded as one world, the seventh, and are so connected with each other as to form one world with two branches. So somehow we're connected, particularly with these A, B, C worlds in this uh, particular small range as, as on the diagram. If we're connected to these B and C worlds, can we get in touch? Well, according to Barber, not. He says, nor would it be possible for man to reach them or contact them. The problem, I think, is possibly distance. The, our very nearest star is Alpha Centauri and, Alpha, and Proxima Centauri. That's pictures of them on the right there. They're currently about 7,000 years travelling away by our fastest rocket, and even if we could travel at the speed of light, you know, it would still be four years to get there. There's some ideas of making uh, solar sails that could get there perhaps in 20 years, but they'd be just for probes. And when we get there, what would be there? Well, there is an Earth-like planet there. It's a small red dwarf uh, star, so it's believed to be uh, quite a dim light. And uh, it, it seems like it might have water, but it might be icy, but it might not be much at all. And that's uh, beyond our capacity. If we were to think beyond the Milky Way to our nearest galaxy as a place of uh, life, well, that would be Canis Major. It's a fairly small galaxy, but even that is hugely uh, distant from us. Uh, by If we could use our current rockets, it would take us about 480 million years. Now, to get an idea of how long that time is, that's the time it took us to evolve from, from things like trilobites. And if we could travel at the speed of light, we'd still be taking as long as it took us to get out of the cave, so it's an enormous distance away. The closest galaxy to us that is actually similar to us is Andromeda. It's even much the same size. That's the galaxy that Hubble found that proved that we, there were actually galaxies outside our own. And if you're in the Northern Hemisphere, you can actually see it in the sky. It's not so easy to see down here in Australia, but it's a little fudge there in this picture. Andromeda has a trillion solar systems and this is what it looks like. Hubble's even been able to get some close-ups of, of the stars that make up Andromeda, as in these photos. But if we could even just had, had a, 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 like a, a solar cell, it would still take us like 12 and a half, and a half million years uh, and much, much longer if we tried to get there by uh, the current rocket, uh, planet, uh, rocket travel. So it's, it's completely out of our reach. If we can't reach the aliens, can they reach us? It's interesting that Barber said something in 1927 that I keep thinking about. He says that our Earth too is a mere bright dot for those who see it from their planet. So he's actually saying that 
somewhere out there you can actually see the earth it's actually there's actually people that see our earth and we know that in our night sky the, a number of the stars that we see actually have exoplanets as in these charts here this brings me to the topic of flying saucers uh, i think many in the barber community are aware of the quote from Barba that, that the flying saucers do not come from other planets, that's an Ivy Deuce. But I, I found a, a longer version of this that's recorded in, um, uh, in The Awakener, and, and it goes on to say that the full story can't be told, but that as books are being published that, to prove that sources come from Venus, etc., this part of the explanation can be given. And that, to me, actually says something, because at that time there was a lot of movies and uh, novels and so on about aliens coming from Venus and Mars and Saturn and so forth. And also, at that time, exoplanets weren't known about it. They weren't discovered until 1995. So I keep wondering, does it, is actually Barber there talking about uh, planets in our solar system? What people don't realise is that when Barber made this statement, it wasn't just science fiction that believed other planets were inhabited in our solar system. It was also science as it was at the time. This series of pictures here is actually all from science magazines. You'll see the first one, they were actually thinking there were signals coming from Mars. This was an ongoing debate in the radio world for a while. Uh, the, the central map there of Mars is, is actually was actually published in the 30s and they were still believing there were canals and possibly people and you can see there was a sketch that was done at that time showing the canals of Mars which they thought were done by intelligent people. This is all the t at the time when Barb was making these statements. There's similar discussions were, were going on about uh, uh, so, uh, there being people on, on Venus. And even quite recently, you'll see there's, there's an image there from a science mag magazine from the 1940s. And this is a serious scientific study that was done, and they, they believe there could be creatures that look like this. And Carl Sagan himself, who's sort of the person associated with, with uh, the popularization of modern science was was picturing the, that Mars might have these strange plants and things that this was uh, a sketched uh, a painting that was actually done based on his on his uh, talks and what he said w was possible on this topic we have a rather curious issue that uh, concerns this book called 61 questions and answers uh, I've had a fair bit of email discussion with Kendra Croson on this because it's something that fascinated her too. And it's an interesting piece because it was put out in, in 1968 by Chari, uh, who was one of Barber's devotees. And from her research, as far as she could work out, it was permitted by Barber to have this appendix. Although the appendix is a, is a very sort of long-winded story about how people from outer space are going to save us. Uh, and so on. And, and it's got a number of statements in it which we just know today are false, like that this one here I've got here from page 30, that there's other globes in this solar system that are inhabited. Well, that doesn't seem to be the case. Uh, and I, we don't really know what to make of it. In fact, was, was Barber just uh, very uh, uh, compassionate towards uh, Chari, or is, it, is, is there something in this that's beyond that? Similarly, we have this memory from uh, Vesta Viking when she was uh, living with some of the Mundli that a UFO came to Merizad, and, and this is the, the full account that apparently this happened in 1976 and that Alaba saw it and that Erich commented on it. Uh, the Mundli commented on it and said, oh, it's the same one that came before, and they felt it was drawn to the area uh, by Barber's presence. On a similar vein, we, there's this letter which uh, Kendra shared with me, and then I since then approached uh, the the owners of the uh, of this, and they permitted me to publish this. And it was to from money to Kari Ben Shammai, who's if you know, she was the main leader of the Israeli group. She was very interested in U UFOs, and so she wrote to Barbara. She was concerned. She wanted the aliens to know about Barbara, and she thought she would she could contact them and and tell them about about Barbara. What I found interesting in, in in Money's reply, which is taking what Barber told her to tell uh, Kari, is that it doesn't outright say, no, there are no uh, people, aliens who are contacting Earth. It just says, don't contact them. It says, Barber wants you not to contact them, and that if he wants them developed, well, that'll happen in their own time. And this, this statement too, it is God's compassion for them that brings him to Earth. Stop worrying about contacting the people from other planets and I think that's probably the final word on it whether the aliens are contacting us or not. 
And why does Barber not want us to worry about contacting aliens? Well, he himself says the whole universe with all its vastness, grandeur and beauty is nothing but sheer imagination. And I love this image that that he himself dictated, which shows the, the real everything has got a, a real nothing and then false everythings with innumerable nothings and then temporary nothing. So there's just nothing into nothing into nothing. I want to explore here a bit about how then does outer space connect with us. And one of the interesting things I found is, is Baba saying that each soul in, creates infinitely out of its unconsciousness. So in a way we're all dreaming the universe in, in different forms. Further to that, Baba says this very intriguing thing that although the planets seem to be very far off from each other, they're, they're in reality very close. And he even goes on to, to explain that um, once you understand the principle of how near everything is, though, although it seems to be far away, and that how connected they are, you'll understand. But which makes me wonder, you know, is there, is there something we're missing in the whole picture? One explanation for this that I find in Hinduism and Buddhism is is the idea that the biggest of the big becomes the smallest of the small. And we know for a, a fact that atoms are structurally rather similar to solar systems. So there's a, there's this interesting thing even with the nature of the universe seen from a distance, how it looks quite similar to a solid. Baba himself hints at this warping from large to small when he says that stars like planets are spheres and that after realisation a man sees them issuing out of himself in millions like tiny bubbles. And that's again the bubble metaphor. From 1921 we have this famous incident where Baba had to stop uh, Pasni counting all the planets because he would uh, drop his body and then, and then uh, Baba himself tried to count the planets and the same thing happened to him. Uh, and Baba's explanation of that was that it's because the universes uh, are spinning uh, so so rapidly. And we now know today that, that even the galaxies are going at incredibly fast rates. They're all turning around vastly faster than we can ever imagine. What I find interesting about that uh, incident is that it shows that further along the spiritual path you should be able to see all this. And in fact, we have a quote from Baba that... Uh, that that it said that what scientists with their powerful telescopes worth thousand dollars are unable to see the spiritual aspirant, uh, even on the first plane, can see. He talks about them being able to see these innumerable light globes, and what's interesting about that is that he says that this is what enchants them. So they they're able to see this in some sort of way that is that is so enchanting, brilliant, and beautiful that that they remain fixed and and stuck there. So they're actually having a vision of the of the universe of some form. There's also the explanation from Baba that yogis and, and people are higher up on the spiritual ladder are actually physically connected to the sun. And that there's the example given of the yogi who would stand in one position to maintain contact with the sun. And, and Baba did a lot of uh, sketches about that. What's interesting from this, and this is from the Tiffin lectures, is that he says that the Sadhguru is united with the sun itself. And I found that a profound uh, statement because... We know that so many religions of the past used to worship the sun and, and even when they weren't worshipping the sun they might say that Jesus is like the sun or that Buddha is, is, a, is a sun being. So there seems to be a, a physical connection between a, a, an advanced being and, and the universe. So how does this happen? And, and Well, we have one statement from Baba that all the universes are interrelated and, and they actually there's a sort of chain reaction where they create each other. In May, a message of 1929, Barbara explains that this reflection and counter-reflection is how the, seven wor the seventh world is, is interconnected, and that, that's the A, B, C planets that we're talking about. And he makes this interesting statement that our, our sun has just one... Uh, we've, got, we've got our planet and we've got one moon and one sun, and then he says in the B planet says there's apparently uh, two suns and, and, and they have two moons and, and four. So it seems like it, it doubles up. And Baba's statement isn't as, as odd as it seems because we now know there are planetary systems that have uh, two and some of the three uh, plus suns. So I think this is exciting in a way because it gives us somewhere to look for uh, humans. He also explains this as sort of uh, the the light globe from the creator reflecting and making the sun, and then the, which is our A sun, and then 
counter-reflecting until you get down to the sea in this, in this chart here. This also seems to be how the master is reflected in the sun and the sun is reflected in the master. Barber talks about the light globes, which in his uh, uh, cosmology is, is sort of a, an aspect of God, gets reflected as in the in the gross world as a sun and then floats. Uh, it, the reflection back creates the gross world. If the universe is an illusion, why do we bother about outer space? I've, I can think of four reasons, and this is what I'm um, going to conclude on. The first is that, that Barbara himself said that it's it's a bit of a symbol of, of reality. He says in this, this is from May, a message, that the stars and the suns and the planets and so on are shadows of the shadows, and they seem amazing and, and brilliant. And they said, can you just imagine from that how brilliant and splendor the real God is, the real light is? The second reason is what I like to call stellar devotion, and that's the fact that Barbara says that these light globes, uh, they're, they're the real form of the living perfect master and, and that the, the aspirant who is spiritually advanced can actually see this. I think this is some sort of connection between the sort of cosmic body of gods and, and what we see in the stars around it. So apparently at some level on the spiritual path you can actually see this and, and the stars are a sort of a, some um, tangible... Uh, remnant or or or, uh, or symbol of 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 your master, and I, I find that enthralling. The third and final value for me of outer space is is just showing our own limitations. It's it's for me like a, a lesson in humility. There's a there's a wonderful quote from Barbara on this. How can the mind imagine the vast limitlessness of creation? It cannot. Why not? Because we try to understand with the mind, the, that which is beyond mind. This brings me to my final Barber quote, which you may have noticed was the same quote I had in the very first slide. And this was what really grabbed my attention and made me uh, think of doing this presentation in the, in the first place. And it's from the three incredible weeks. Imagine God as infinite space. And Barber then asks us to try to grasp what this means. And I think the whole lesson in, in looking into the, the, the sheer scale and the beauty of the universe is, is just to, to understand the, the bigness of, of God, just like the huge teddy bear that, that barbers this enormity. And it can really help you to, to see that if you can actually visualize it uh, in, in these ways. Thank you.